Hello and welcome to video 3 in the Welcome to the A310 series. Today's video is going to take place in London Gatwick Airport once again, but this time we're over on the other side of the airfield near the cargo area and the maintenance area and the flight we're going to be undertaking is in the A310 freighter, a model we haven't looked at yet. This all comes included in the A310 base package along with the ACJ which is the business jet version of the A310 which we will look at at the end of today's video. So what's today's video going to be about? First of all we're going to look at a failure, I'm not going to say what it is and we're going to let the failure play out in real time. So we're going to depart out of London Gatwick, something's going to happen and we're going to have to make a decision and everything that happens after that will be done as I would as an airline pilot on the line to try and make a decision do we divert do we continue do we return you won't know and I won't know until I make that decision it's not going to be run 100% in real time because that would probably take a while but I'll cut out areas that are basically just flying level and not doing anything else but try and keep in most of the failure management and coming back um, should be really kind of fun exercise to try and do the second part, we're going to look at a really cool maneuver that can be done in the A310 because the A310 is used by the European Space Agency for zero-g flights. So, you know, when you see all those people floating around in the back of an A310 or, or in an aircraft, it, it is an A310 and it's a profile that we are going to try and fly and so you can have a go if you want to try that at home. We're going to end the video off by taking a closer look at the A310 freighter and the ACJ just a few more of the features that are in it and that will be the video. It's not as packed as the other videos because the scenario at the start is going to take a while so let's get straight into it. Okay so here we are at the maintenance ramp in Gatwick Airport. We're going to get going, we're just going to taxi out, take off, something's going to happen and then we're going to make a decision that's appropriate for that failure and run through it in full. So next you're going to join me when we're by the ramp. Okay so we're now at the holding point for runway 26 left, let's have a look if there's any traffic on final can't see anything and as said before this is the busiest single runway operation airport in the world actually so there's more than likely going to be someone on flight and approach it looks like we're good to go so going through the departure here it's quite an early turn speed constraint of 220 knots up to a stop altitude of 4,000 feet this is always due to the traffic in the London area there's a lot of different airports that crisscross over the top of Gatwick Airport and um, you're often given step climbs from four to 5,000 and then from five normally up to about 13,000. So, we are ready to go. Let's stabilize these engines. That was a terrible lineup, but that's fine. Okay, half forward on the stick. Control wheel, as I should say. Quite high flex temperature of 57. Um, it's a reasonably long runway, not too, not too heavy. Okay, thrust is set. Releasing the stick by 100 knots, and we have 100 knots. One rotates. Positive climb. Gear up. Gear up. AP one. Okay, gears coming up. P thrust. P climb. Flaps fifteen zero. Okay, autopilot's disconnected. Okay, let's stabilize the aircraft. We're still climbing away. We're going to go back onto the flight directors. We've got a master caution. The autopilot's disconnected. Clear that. So let's focus on flying the aircraft first. We've got this first turn coming up. So flap zero, let's get clean. Let's try the other autopilot. Okay, AP2's worked. AP2 is in. We've got command two. We're at green dot speed. Let's go vertical speed. Bring that down to about a thousand feet per minute. Gear to neutral. Let's clean the aircraft up. Spoilers to disarm. Now it lights up when we're off. Great. So, 
let's have a look at what we've got on the ECAM now. We've got a thousand feet to go. So we're going to level off soon. We're in nav, everything's looking good. Another master caution. So we have a flight control flap system 2 fault. Let's have a look on the overhead. Yes, I have a flap and a slat light up there, which is uh, not great, but let's see. So let's run through the ECAM. Let's pop this out and let's use the ECP down here. Obviously, I'm going to leave it popped out so we can see it. So we've got slat system fault, we've got a pitch trim one reset. Okay, we'll look at these afterwards. Pitch field one fault, and there we have a green system low pressure. So let's monitor our flight path. We're still looking good, 220 knots, and we're at 4,000 feet now. So, brake anti-skid, alternate on. So let's do that now, and let's clear the hydraulic. Clear the hydraulic flight control, pitch feel one off and the spoiler faults. So we cleared a few of those spoiler faults which we should have run through but let's run through them now. So we've got spoiler 5 faults which we can turn off and a pitch feel one fault which we can turn off as well. It also mentioned that one of our pitch trims had come off. Let's try and re-engage it. Okay it's re-engaged now that's good so it re-latched. It was probably just due to the transient failure. Okay, we're inbound there now, we're level at 4,000 feet, that's good. Let's clear the rest of this ECAM up and see what the status page says. So status, we have a lot of things, so let's focus on our flight path here. So we've got landing distance multiplied by 1.2, we need to increase our approach speed by 10 knots. We've got a flap and a slat system fault, in more fuel consumption, pitch field fault, hydraulic system low pressure, landing gear graffiti extension and a spoiler fault along with the slat and the hydraulic system. So let's take this in and think about it for a second. First of all we're safe, uh, we're at 4,000. I, I feel happy to go up to 5,000 feet which is what they would give us a step climb to but we'll do that slowly in vertical speed. So vertical speed 5,000 is blue and 1,000 is go. So what we saw from the ECAM there was uh, green system fault. All of the other failures were associated with a green system fault, which is what I can see from here. And that's what the status page is letting us know. It's going, these are what are broken, but you can use a bit of logic that we've got that green system low pressure, ECAM, and also you can see it says hydraulic green system inop. And if we have a look, we can see that we have low pressure on that panel there. So that makes sense. Now, what are the important things that we've got here? Well, now we have to try and think about our options. So do we want to fly to Frankfurt with no green hydraulic system operative? Um, we could. We could continue to Frankfurt if we wanted to um, because we've got a working autopilot, we have a working auto thrust. but let's take a look more. It says fuel consumption increased. We also have all these different procedures to work through, pitch feel, landing gear gravity extension, I'm starting to feel like maybe it's not a good idea to continue there. So let's take a look at what we've got in the sort of local area around us. Okay, so if I make this bigger we can see it together. We've got South End Airport, that is definitely not a good place to go. We've got Stansted. That's pretty good, it's a pretty long runway, 3,000 odd metres with an ILS. And we've got Gatwick that we've just come from, and of course we've also got Heathrow. So we've got a lot of good airports around here. I would probably say that coming back to Gatwick makes the most sense. That we've got good weather, we've got good weather and everything else around us, but why don't we just check on the weather for these different airports? And we can actually check that on either, if we had the IDC fitted, we could print the weather and take a look or we can look at it in the tablet, but just for the sake of making it easy, let's look at the tablet. So we're going to update the weather here, and we're also going to look for Echo Golf Sierra Sierra, and we're going to query that. So we've got a 180 at 14, a little bit windy, broken, good temperature. Gatwick still looks good to come back for, and let's have a look at Heathrow. So again, weather's looking good, scattered at 1,900, 17 degrees. So 
You know, to be honest, it's it, all these different airports we talked about were pretty good, but Gatwick makes the most sense because it's a base and we just departed from there, and it's behind us. So, why don't we enter the hold over the waypoint ahead of us, um, and then we can decide where we're going to come back to exactly. So, let me do that now. So, 4,000, 5,000 feet, that's fine. We're going to hold Delta Victor Romeo, in fact then we can come back afterwards and have most things sorted by then. So we'll click here, we'll click the other side actually, is the correct? Hold, 097 inbound, yeah that's fine, and we are going to insert the hold. So we've got the hold inserted there now, and I'm going to climb up to 8,000 feet because they want us out of a fair few airspace around here. So let's do that at a slow vertical speed. 8,000 is blue, and we can set standard, so flight level 80 is blue, and we've got vertical speed, 1,000 feet below, should be fine now actually, and we can keep it at green dot speed, 226. So let's start thinking about these procedures that we've got to work through. Flap system 2, slat system 2, now I know from memory, the only thing that comes from those are their slats and the flaps a little bit slower. Procedure, fuel consumption increased. Now, why is, it, why is it increased? Well, because the green system is no longer pressurizing the aircraft, a few of these flight controls are kind of hanging in the air. It's not the biggest increase of fuel, but it's something to be aware of. So how much fuel do we have? So we can take a look on the overhead. We've got three, uh, so we've got a lot of fuel. That you can see we've got three tons almost in each tank, um, which is perfectly fine. Pitch fuel faults. Um, there's no associated procedure with that unless the other one fails, but that's something to think about. And the hydraulic system low pressure we talked about. Now, gravity gear extension is a, a thing to discuss, and we'll discuss that now. So, why is that procedure come up? Well, the green hydraulic system controls the gear, the retraction and extension of the landing gear. And it, the green system is no longer there anymore. So, why did our autopilot drop out as well? Well, the autopilot number one is associated with the green hydraulic system, which doesn't work anymore, which is why you saw me fly the aircraft and then think, right, let's try the other autopilot. Yep, it worked. Now, let me try the other autopilot again now. So, first of all, I'm gonna disconnect the autopilot and I'm gonna try and engage it, but it won't latch, as you can see, because it just won't engage because there's no hydraulics there, but command two will which makes sense, so let's go back on the status page. Alright, so for gravity gear extension, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to use this little handle down here. Now I know that these head movements and things aren't as smooth as the other videos I've produced, but we're trying to do this as real, like real time as possible. So how do we use this? Well, you can see there's a click spot here, and what we're going to do is you click and hold this click spot for around five seconds and a handle is going to appear and then the gear will drop by gravity. Uh, but we're going to do that later on because we'll talk about this consequences we'll talk about that right now. Alright, so we're approaching Delta Victor Romeo. It's looking good. So that what are the consequences of the gravity gear extension? When the gear is down, it's not coming back up again. And when the gear is down, the gear doors are going to stay down with them and we are going to have a huge amount of drag. Huge. And when I mean that, I mean double to triple the normal fuel burn. So once this gear is down, we're committed. I mean, we have a lot of fuel, so we could try again. But in terms of go-around performance, that's you, there's a lot. Because like I say, you've not just got the gear drag, you've also got the drag from the doors. Now that's all simulated as well. You will see it that when I drop it, it's uh, significant, I would say. Um, the spoiler fault, now that's a spoiler number five. So let's take a look at the flight control page. Okay, let's pop that out as well, because I know it can be harder to see on the videos. That's in amber, and you can see that the green system is in amber here as well, showing that the stabilizer trim has only got one associated system. But to be honest, that that's not it's not going to make a significant difference um, to the landing roll and we can also while we're here take a look at the hydraulic system so it's, uh, it's powered down and it's not going to work um, it's inoperative it's gone basically we've got no pressure there at all 
but we've still got the other systems fully functional, which is good. Well, you know, I think we said we were going to hold at Delta Victor Romeo. I think we've got we're okay now to try and start setting up for our return to Gatwick. Now, what we can do is we want to go after Delta Victor Romeo, so Conan, new route two. So we're going to go back to Gatwick Airport. Now you can see that the flight plan has updated itself. We're going to scroll all the way down to the end. And we're going to do star, ILS 26, with no arrival. And now what we can do is we can go direct to and we're going to go direct to the center fix to get us heading back in the right direction. Center fix, insert, and we're already in nav. So, now we're heading back to the airport, 31 miles away, so that is good. And let's take a look at how that looks in plan mode. Alright, that's looking pretty good actually, that's going to bring us almost straight back towards the airport for the ILS, so I'm pretty happy with that. Let's leave it out like that. 8,000 feet, how many miles have we got left to go? 40,000, 40 miles, not 40,000. So let's say platform altitude is 3,000 feet. We can start a very slow descent soon down. So let's think about the rest of what we have left to do. So our approach speed we need to think about. So let's update the FMS because it thought it was going up to flight level 230. Uh, not, so we've gone up to 80. So we're on the cruise now, so the FMS gives us a top of descent. So, first of all, it says landing speed increase by 10 knots. So we're going to put 10 in there, which gives us 155. Now we also have to increase that by 20% because our landing distance is multiplied by 1.2. Not our approach speed, but our physical landing roll will be increased by that much um, because of the increased speed. And the final item is the brake. So remember, I said that some systems run off the system, uh, off the green system. So let's start our descent down now. We're leisurely, seven hundred feet per minute. A little speed. In fact, let's go down the level change and then trigger it back to normal speed. So that's good. So we have our VDEV. Now let's try and set the auto brakes. Ah, they don't work. Now, why don't they work? Because the green system powers the brakes and the green system doesn't work. So remember part of that was to switch this to alternate on. So now the yellow system, so the system from the right hand side, is controlling the braking of the aircraft. Now this means it's going to be manual braking and I unfortunately I do have a joystick trigger so it's going to be a bit jerky if I'm honest. <laughs> So stick with me through that one, but obviously if you have rudder, if you have rudder pedals, proper brakes, uh, mine aren't quite right at the moment, you would be able to smoothly decelerate the aircraft, but it's going to be manual braking only, and we're quite fast. So that's something to think about. The other thing is this will show braking pressure on this indicator because we are using the yellow system now, not the green system. I think that's everything, so let's look ahead and think about what we're going to so we're heading back towards the runway. Let's tune the ILS. So let's get that up now. Think about the MDA. So the MDA for Gatwick, I believe, is 400 feet for this approach. We can activate final approach mode. Okay, I just tuned the ILS. Let's see if we're getting any signal. Right, we're getting something. Distance-wise, we've got 6,000 feet. And we have 31 miles to go. Good. So, how are we going to fly this approach? Um, so, we're going to fly it. Obviously, we're going to be level before we go down. We're going to go 15-0, 15-15, and then we're going to go 20-20. Now, I'll explain why in a minute. The reason we want to decelerate all the way back to that is because we then want to do the gravity gear extension, which is going to take a little bit of time. It's going to add a lot of drag, so we want to give ourselves a bit more time. So we're going to go level change now, so we're coming down as fast as we can, down to 3,000 feet. Slats and flaps are a little bit slower, because I told you because of the fault, so we want to kind of leave ourselves a bit more time. 
So change of the plan, let's actually configure 15-15, then once we're 15-15, we'll do what we normally would do, put the gear down, we're going to do that via the gravity gear extension procedure, and then we're going to configure all the way for a flat 30-40 landing. Now, how do we do this gravity gear extension procedure? I showed you where the click spot is down there. So what we do is we hold the click on there, we'll hear the gear come down, we we'll take a look at it on the outside and you'll see that the gear doors are down. And then we put the landing gear down. Because you can see, look, the landing gear lever isn't doing anything. The system doesn't work anymore. But we need to put the landing gear lever down in case the hydraulic system starts working again, it will put our gear up, which is obviously not what we want <laughs> at all. Um, so that's why you also put it down after it's come down itself to make sure everything is locked and in the same position. So, I think that makes sense. We're pretty much running this in real time, which is good. So we've got 16 miles to go, easily going to be level. We've only got 1,000 feet odd left to go now, so I am going to slow that down a little bit, 1,000 feet per minute. And why don't we, as we said, these slats and flaps are going to be a bit slow. Let's start configuring. We've got plenty of fuel, plenty of time. So first setting a flap, 50, 0, let's bring the speed back to S speed. Now, last thing that I hadn't thought about until this very moment is our weight. We are 125 tonnes. Now that is over the maximum land weight for this aircraft. So there is an overweight landing procedure to try and run, so I'm going to quickly try and look that up. Alright, so we're going to level off soon, but what we've got to do for this overweight landing procedure is we're actually going to start the APU. Now, why are we starting the APU? Well, when you're overweight, you've got a few problems. You are, you've got go-around problems, and you've also got structural limitations. So let's get the seconds. Let's get flaps 15, 15 out to slow us down to give us more time because now we need some thinking time. So let's set 175 knots. And let's set standard as well, which we should have done before. 1005 is set. Speed out, remember that just at the right moment. And we're leveling off. So let's see if this is okay speed wise. 170, yep. Okay, we need to be F plus 20, so 175. Actually, let's go right. Right, so why are we starting the APU? So we're starting the APU because we can then do this. Once the APU is a fail, which it is, we're going to turn the APU bleed on. Now you saw the, the system reconfigure itself. So now if we go and look down at the bleed page, which is here, and we pop it out, can you see that the bleed valves for the engines are closed? Now they're closed so the engines are not supplying any more bleed air to the system. The APU is co coping with it. So if we do need to go around, so if we do need to go around, then the system is basically going to be able to go, yeah, it's fine, I have enough go around performance and that's all covered. That's part of the procedure, so that's done. The next part is to determine our landing speed. Well, we've already done that and that is also determined by the hydraulic failure that we have. So, change to the brief, I'm going to go for the next set in the flap because I want to slow down a bit more to give ourselves a bit more time. So 158 is how slow we can fly now with Config 2020. Because we are now going to give ourselves a bit of a margin of fact, 70, and we're going to do the gravity gear extension procedure. So, first of all, let's go across to the gravity gear extension handle, and we click and we hold. Now that, so in reality, this will spin around and around, and what we can see is we can see gear doors are coming unlocked. I can hear the gear coming down. Yeah. Okay, it's got, the thrust is coming up because of the amount of drag that we've got. And we've been cleared for the ILS, so that's good. Let's put that in. Now, can you see that we've got the greens down, but the doors are unlocked? Let's take a look on the outside. Here we go, see? So we've got all of our gears down, but the door is still down as well. So that's a bit of a problem when it comes to drag. So to finish the procedure off, put the gear physically down as well. Actually, why we approach that early. Right, so now the next stage is we're going to wait until we get within about 10 miles on the ILS, we're going to get onto the localizer, and then I'm going to put the last set of flap in so we don't have all the gear down and all the drag because we've already got quite a lot of thrust on. 
The final part of the overweight landing checklist says to minimise vertical speed to less than 360 feet per minute on landing. Now, that is one of the only places I know that Airbus actually talk about feet per minute and landing. Because we know we all love that in the sim, but one of the only places, interestingly enough. So basically Airbus are giving you the go-ahead to do a smooth landing. <laughs> so we can descend down to 2,500 feet, as that is the clearance. And we'll go down 500 feet per minute, but clear for the approach, and we'll 160 miles an hour. Alright, looking good. Here comes the localizer, lock star. I'm visual with the airport. Officially, IKO says descent of less than 500 feet per minute is not considered a descent, but uh, if you don't say, I won't say. GS star, missed approach altitude, 3000 feet is set. Final stage of flap, 155 was our approach speed, 154 even now given the weight, so that's done. I'm going to leave the autopilot in for as long as possible, uh, basically just to minimise our workload. The aircraft flies perfectly fine with one hydraulic failure. Um, now obviously where this workload gets a bit higher is if you have a double hydraulic failure. So remember we said that we turned the other autopilot on because it was required. If both of them are gone, then you have no autopilot. And this whole thing becomes significantly more difficult. But that's normally why you have a two-person flight deck, because one person can fly, one person can do procedures. So, let's just double check we've got everything done, so we've got the gear down, we've got this on, let's put all of our lights on now, so our final approach, this is on, the strobes are on, the nav lights are on, the runway turn offs are on, and we can put the two continuous. Alright, so we're still looking good. We're cat 2, remember? Now, why are we cat 2, not cat 3 as we were normally? Well, the other autopilot won't engage, so simply we're cat 2 only. And I believe on the status page, a bit of an inappropriate time for me to look at it, but it doesn't really matter, is on the top right it says land 3 in on, so no auto lands, which, I mean, kind of makes sense, right? This is a bit of an unusual configuration. Uh, Airbus is saying, hey, I want you to fly the plane, that's what you're paid for, <laughs> which is fair enough. So, past a thousand feet, let's... Let's disconnect the autopilot and let's fly a little bit. I'm going to leave the auto thrust in, again, minimising my sort of workload. Now, one of the keys to sort of flying the A310 well, I say well when I'm getting low on the approach, is to try and minimise the amount of trim. The trim is very fast, very, very fast in the 310. So when I disconnected the autopilot, the autopilot thought it was in trim. So why mess with it? It normally is roughly about right. If you saw, I clicked or blipped the trim just a tiny, tiny bit, but really I'm not changing it much. I'm kind of changing my pitch. We've got land, so we're good. The threshold in sight. So I'm just trying to maintain a kind of a constant vertical speed down. And there's the maintenance area on the left that we started our eventful flight for, getting a tiny bit low there. Fixing the aiming point now. It's not what we want when we're heavy. We're down. Versus. Okay, we're going to see how far that gets us. Alright, now use the brakes. You can see the brakes are showing on the triple indicator now. All brakes regular is doing fine. So we're going to come down. And we're going to stop on the center line. I have no nose wheel steering, because guess what? 
is also attached to the green system. So I just thought I'd do that to show you. So we're going to come to a stop, set the parking brake, relax, relax. We're back on the ground. He is down, so let's think about this. We've got pitch field one fault, so that's probably because we landed and kind of re-triggered the faults. So let's bring up the status page. Yeah, we're all good. Okay, good. So let's start cleaning up the aircraft. Arms, stow those. Okay, so here we are on the ground. Now, Target's going to pull us off the runway. As I mentioned just before we came to a stop there, the nose wheel steering doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's something that I didn't even think about actually until we came on the landing roll, I'll be completely honest with you. Again, this is why there's normally two people in the flight deck. I've left the flaps and slats down purposely as we have the engines off. Reason for that is it was a green hydraulic failure we don't really know what caused it, I'd rather leave them down so we can get towed off the runway and have a look at them afterwards, uh, there could be a burst line in there, something like that, so it's a, it's a ferry flight as well, so we're not going to okay. have people evacuate. all doors and hatches are closed, ready to connect alright, he's connecting up, that's good well, I hope you enjoyed that, it was run in real time, so I'm sure there's mistakes in there uh, again, I'm not a type rated pilot on the A310, but was trying to use as many procedures and sort of things that you would in a, in a real aircraft, and showing you how you truly can run failures in this aircraft successfully, there we thought about the, uh, the use of the APU for the, the overweight landing procedure, that all worked properly closed the bleed valves off, and meant that the engine was had more thrust available for the go around we then executed the gravity gear procedure, which worked as well. We then had to use manual braking because the auto brake system wouldn't work. And also, you saw on the departure, I lost the autopilot because so that was also coupled up properly. Release parking brake. Okay, parking brake is released. Starting tow, and you may start engine. Well, he said I may start engines, but that's not what we want today. <laughs> Then we also made use of the brake fan after we come to a stop because yeah, brakes are getting a bit hot. And yeah, so you can see how this is all really, really connected together and how the gear doors are now stuck down. So let's take a look at those on the outside. So we can see here as we're getting pulled off the runway, the gear doors are still stuck down um, and they will remain so. It actually, like I said, we'll talk about it a little bit more now. It increased the drag. Uh, I think the fuel burn penalty is 1.8 or 2.8 percent. It's 2.8 times percent, sorry, was what I mean. So it's it's huge. As I said, that's about it really. I think I'm going to end this section here. Um, I hope you learned a little bit. Uh, it was all a bit quick as you saw maybe in real life I'd take a bit longer because uh, we had the fuel because in fact how much fuel did we land with we landed with 10 tons so we burnt about four tons three four tons during that procedure so we had time um, but do you really want to watch me go around the hold 30 times while I talk about a procedure endlessly probably not so that's why it was a bit expeditious um, but yeah hope you enjoyed it and let's move on okay you join me back on the runway in london gatwick airport runway 26 left we're loaded up with fuel we're off to a flight to north america with reasonably high payload again out of gatwick so let's just run this failure in real time we're just going to take off and see what happens all right ready okay great parking brake is off set the thrust up and we're in the pratt and whitney engines not that it's any different Okay, thrust is stabilized. Thrust, SRS, and heading. Okay, thrust is set, half stick forward. Start releasing the back pressure. 100 knots, neutral. 100 knots, checked. Now in the high speed regime. Okay, stop. Okay, reverse screen. Decel. 70 knots. 
Master warning, master caution. Parking brake set. Okay, what have we got here? We have an engine one fire. Okay, that's confirmed by the fire light on the overhead panel and the warning we've got elsewhere. So what are the actions? We've got fuel lever one off. Fire handle one pull. Okay, let's pull. We have to hold this for one, two, three, and it's gone. Next item is agent one discharge. Okay, let's discharge agent number one. Let's see what the next iron item is. Okay, the procedure on air ground, so we can now try, and I know from memory, we can also try agent number two. Okay, fire has gone out on engine number one. That's good. Let's check the EGT. It's cooling down now. What's the other one that we've got? We've got a cargo compartment smoke. Okay, so it looks like we had an engine one fire and a fire in the cargo compartment. So it's saying agent one discharge. And that's confirmed we have a smoke in the forward. So let's unlock this. Okay, discharge agent number one. And discharge agent number two. Okay, we still have positive signs of fire. We still have the smoke light. This could be due to the fact that the agents discharge inside there actually keep the smoke light on. So let's see what else is going on now. Okay, we've still got the ECAM there. Well, what other failures have we got working through? Okay, we've got brakes are hot now. That was due to the RTO. Okay, let's disarm this and we can give the cabin crew a call. Okay, so let's start clearing this up. Anything else? I'm not really cared, worried about all the spoiler faults. Uh, I'm not going to put the brake fans on in case they're leaking fluid. Right, let's talk to the crew, see what they can see. Alright, we've talked to the crew and they're saying that there's actually a bit of heat from the underneath of the forward floor. So I don't think that fires out. Uh, we can check with the tower and see what they see. Alright, it seems the tower can also see positive signs of fire. I don't think this is going to work out. I think we're going to have to evacuate. Okay, so let's run the emergency evacuation. Let's think what we need to do. So engine number one is already off. And we're going to kill engine number two. And we're going to go into darkness shortly. And we're going to pull the fire handles for all the different engines. Pull it for number one. And we're going to pull it for the engine as well. Okay, let's evacuate. Now we would do the PA for an evacuation. Ground ops, exits, open all. So, as you can see, we've actually modelled the slides. Um, if you don't disarm the doors and open them, all the slides come out. But as you can see, in a scenario like this, it's actually very, very cool to be able to sort of run the scenario, come to a stop, have something that means that you would need to evacuate, and you can fully use these. If you don't want to open the cargo bay doors, um, you can just do individual doors, but I just clicked open all without disarming, just so we could get out there as quick as possible. Okay, as you can see from the inside of the cabin, you actually can see that the doors animate inwards. These are the emergency release doors on both sides of the aircraft, and the slide fully inflates for this very strange looking forward slide. Let's take a look at that. The slide on this side of the aircraft you can see comes forward and over the engine that's why part of the emergency evacuation is to make sure both engines are off before we do initiate that emergency evacuation because as you can imagine getting people to come down that slide straight into the engine would not be a, a good idea at all so that was about it I think we're going to move on um, a little bit of drama added in there um, but as you can see it's kind of cool to be able to run these with the slides Okay, so here we are in the Zero G A310 repaint. Now, what is this flight about? Well, normally the aircraft departs from Bordeaux Airport, which is on the coast of France, the west coast of France, and they normally head off into the uh, over the ocean, which is where we are right now, so we're safe away from everyone else, and they do this very unusual flight. So. This will be the first time that astronauts from the European Space Agency and other space agencies around the world get their first feeling of zero-g flight. The next time they may get that is when they're in space. So let's talk about the profile and go and fly. So what we need to be is we need to be 10 knots below maximum speed at flight level 200. So we're currently at 20,000 feet and we are at 330 knots. Now in the real aircraft they have the auto thrust off and they actually have three people to do this maneuver. One person controls the pitch, one person controls the roll, and the other one controls the thrust. But there's only one of us, so how can we make this simpler? So first thing you want to do is make sure that you have the uh, TRP set to MCT, so we have the maximum amount of thrust available. You also can leave the auto thrust in. I found this to be by far the easiest way to manage it, and 
then we're going to go and fly the maneuver. So what do we do? We disconnect the autopilot, pitch up, and we end up with this display up here, now in the top left corner. Now this shows you your G loading. Now you can add this um, by looking at the screenshot that I'm showing on the screen. And what we want to aim for is initially a 1.5 to 1.7, something like that, G pull. We keep pulling, it's almost like you're rotating off the ground. And we keep pitching up until we reach 47 degrees nose up. Once we get to 47 degrees nose up, we start a gentle push. I mean, it's a bit more than a gentle push, but it's what it seems like to try and maintain zero G. So we try and maintain zero G plus or minus a little margin for as long as possible. And the aircraft will start to pitch down, pitch down till we're about 47 degrees nose down. So actually 42 degrees nose down, but roughly around there. And then we start to do a smooth pull out again, about 1.5 to 1.8 G and that's the end of the maneuver we should end up back roughly at flight level 200 at roughly the same speed well uh, let's go try and do it well turned out it's too hard to fly and talk about this maneuver so this is post commentary me again but we're going to talk about this parabola that we flew so the initial pitch up just keeping it coming up and you can see that the thrust is starting to come on the speed loss looked quite dramatic, but as you can see, it's quite a gradual pull, trying to keep within that G range. It's quite hard to scan between that and the pitch, and I found it quite difficult to scan up, down, up, down, and keep the roll and everything in check. Now, with the push here, you've got to be quite careful that you don't go negative, because negative G is going to damage the airframe. You can hear the engines have come up almost to their full power now, and this is where everyone in the back of the aircraft will be completely weightless. People will be floating now, we're at 0.12 G, and in the real aircraft, they have the windows blocked out to stop this effect of ah going towards the ground. <laughs> but I didn't pitch down quite enough. I think I got down to about 37, 40 degrees, um, which is pretty close. And then I just start this gentle pull out. And it all worked out quite nicely. Could have done with keeping the wings a little bit more straight. Um, but overall, I think the maneuver worked out really well. And basically, that's it with this maneuver. Try it yourself, take off from Bordeaux, go and do a few of them and come back. It's just a really fun thing, another thing you can do with the A310. So let's move on. Welcome to the ACJ variant of the 310. Let's give a little bit of history around this airframe. Technically, um, the ACJ name, which stands for Airbus Corporate Jet, didn't come into effect until the 319 and 320 family were around. But this was a special order A310 in the period uh, with absolutely no expense spared. It first flew or was first delivered in 1987, so it's around 34 and a half years old now, so it's quite an old A310. And it's still flying around now under the registration Hotel Zulu November Sierra Alpha. And it's a for rent uh, business jet at the moment, uh, which is, you can see all over the world. The leasing company that has it also has a 340 and another 737. But what makes the A310 interesting as a business jet is it's got that wide body comfort as we talked around, but it's also got reasonably good short field performance because of the massive engines. You can take 140 tonnes out of a 1500, 1600 metre runway uh, if required, which is, I mean, that's quite respectable. And also it has excellent brakes so you could fly back into that small airport if needed. Obviously handling and things like that need to be taken into account and there's probably quite a few airfields that aren't quite ready to accept a wide body but it can get in and out of quite a few tight spaces. So what have we done different over the normal A310 passenger? It's effectively got a completely different cabin all the way through which we're going to look at and done to extremely high detail. We've obviously got these specialised repaints and the EFB is ever so slightly different just not allowing you to change engine type because the A310 ACJ or this particular airframe was never a Pratt & Whitney equipped aircraft so you'll only be able to use the GE engines on this. So let's talk a little bit more about that interior because that is where this is super special. Okay so where do I even start with the interior on the ACJ? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and move through the cabin with a selection of videos showing at different times of day, trying to show off the different features of the cabin, because if I went through every single one, we'd be here for a very long time. So the layout of the aircraft is, once you walk down this main corridor, on the left side you have a main bedroom. Now in the bedroom, you've got this 
really, really large bed for what you consider, remember, this is a private jet and it looks like a pretty nice hotel room in its entire size with these sort of super cool retro TV screens and some video players and things like that and along with a few other amenities that are around but on suite is a full size shower and bathroom which again is it's pretty rare for a business jet uh, but this just looks absolutely fantastic in the sim um, really one of the highest qualities I've, I've ever seen you know sort of been able to really feel like you're you're in there uh, behind that we have the conference room uh, a sort of leisure room they can be connected by opening a door up in between the bedroom and this room so you can kind of have a uh, sort of large relaxation area again more sofas in here so moving behind there we have the main area of the aircraft which is where people would sort of relax sit around um, you know with all the different sofas and it truly gives you an idea of the width of this aircraft in, in a, this ACJ configuration in the ceiling we've got this big gold lamp it's basically what it is in the real thing but it's just unbelievable how much gold is in this aircraft uh, <laughs> it's, I think it's uh, you know it's not a light thing moving backwards we've got this sort of more it's laid out as a business class with quite a few of these larger seats and also this mural on the wall which is pretty pretty distinctive actually and from this point backwards it's slightly more conventional with overhead lockers and a few places to store things with a projector that will show on the screen um, and also a rear galley but again a little bit more upper class with sort of wood and things like this but this whole cabin is also interactive in terms of the doors so you can open up the door to the bedroom the business uh, sort of area with the, the seats and the rooms in between and it just is a really really cool place to be coupled with the sort of flights that you can do with this thing I know we've talked about range in the first video but you have to think here you've got a wide body business jet that's got if you push it a 6,000 mile range because you're not going to be that heavy on the inside here uh, because of obviously payload wise it's not going to be as much as a, a normal passenger flight and you can take up to 60 tons of fuel and take off out of any airport you want to and also land in basically any airport you want to as long as they can accept your sort of width of wing and that's about the only limitation so it just really is a fantastic um, variant to fly around in and gives you the opportunity to fly anywhere you want in the world because this aircraft has basically been everywhere um, but yeah that's about it from the ACJ let's take a look at the extended features on the freighter version welcome to Seattle and the A310 freighter we're currently in the FedEx repaint FedEx did actually have quite a large fleet of A310 freighters and if any of you will think back to the A300 trailer we're actually on exactly the same stand I filmed that on all that time ago so let's take a look at the extended features that come with the A310 freighter so what are these extended features for the A310 freighter for a 300 customers you will be aware of most of these but let's run through them all again so we have the ability to load the aircraft via calling for the loader on the EFB what this will do is it will make a tug drive up to the aircraft and load containers on one by one via the loader which is all animated and automatic automatically open the door load the containers in and then once the loading process is finished it will close the door and it will wait for you to untick it in the EFB to remove the loader. We also have a different set of steps. These are engineering steps and are what are commonly used on the freighter aircraft so that's why they look different. Uh, the ground power unit is retextured and comes across from the passenger and also we have new doors in the courier area which is what the area is called when you come out of the flight deck because it's where sort of people are couriered around in. Uh, the few stickers and decals in here have been updated to meet the highest standard of the A300 passenger. The interactive panel still all works. You can open and close the cargo door. Turn the lights on in here in case of a night condition so you can have the entrance light or the main light on in the freighter area. And also you can open that door all the way to the 145 degree position whereas normally it will come up in the 70. Now that's it really for the A310 freighter it was a fantastic freighter aircraft as we talked about before because it was really wide and served FedEx really really well for many many years but what is coming up after the A310 freighter well we have still got two more variants so included in this A310 package is the A310 freighter which we just looked at GE and Pratt & Whitney the A310 passenger GE and also Pratt & Whitney 
alongside the GE only ACJ variant. Now coming later down the line will be the MRTT and Medivac variants. These stand for multi-role transport tanker and the Medivac goes with this for the military expansion which will be coming post release. But that will be free of charge to A310 customers. I think that's a pretty good package, all five of these aircraft which I've shown that you can do a lot of different things with, zero G flights, RTOs, failures, freighter flights, go to military routes, uh, there's a lot to do. And I really uh, thank you for sitting through these videos, I know that's pretty long, all of them together it's nearly three hours of content, but that truly is how much content we have to offer with this package. And uh, thank you very much and hope that you can get your hands on the A310 as soon as possible.